when in evolution did vitamin D make its first appearance on Earth? And it turns out that we worked at Woods Hole. It's a very famous um, oceanic uh, laboratory. And we grew an organism that's existed in the Atlantic Ocean, a phytoplankton, for more than 750 million years unchanged. When we exposed this organism to sunlight, it made vitamin D. We think that vitamin D may be one of the oldest hormones made on this earth. And obviously necessary. Well, not only necessary, but it's been suggested by me and others that it's quite possible that one of the reasons for the demise of the dinosaurs is that once that asteroid hit the earth and it caused that pall of pollution and yep. all and the rest, they yep. couldn't make any vitamin D. They would have had muscle weakness, severe bone problems. It would have been very devastating for them on top of the fact that they had less food and it was cold. Do you find that people then tend to be a little more healthier in the summer than the winter when they're out more and they get more sunlight than when it's really cold, let's say? Yeah, people feel better, for sure, when they're exposed to sunlight. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But also, we've shown that if you're vitamin D deficient, you wind up having these generalized aches in your bones and muscles. Often, uh, people will just kind of write it off as winter blues, or the doctors will say that the patient has fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. These are classic symptoms for vitamin D deficiency, and it's known as osteomalacia. And so people that complain of throbbing, aching bone pain, muscle aches and pains, muscle weakness, especially in the wintertime, it's likely due to vitamin D deficiency. Why do people get depressed when they don't see the sun? Well, the major explanation for seasonal affective disorder is that um, it's the intensity and duration of sun exposure directly through your eyes that regulates the production of melatonin. So at night, your melatonin levels go up and you want to go to sleep. And as the sun is rising, the intensity of the light coming through your eyes suppresses melatonin levels, so now you want to be awake and active. However, probably about 40 to 60 percent of both children and adults that live in northern latitudes cannot recognize sunlight intensity in the wintertime. They need much higher intensity light in order to suppress their melatonin levels. So when they get up in the morning, their melatonin levels aren't suppressed. And so as a result, they want to go back to sleep. They want to hibernate. And as a result, they feel miserable throughout the wintertime. And so bright light therapy works very well. But there's also a study showing that some patients that have kind of the winter blues, if they increase their vitamin D intake, they feel a lot better. And it's in part due to this vitamin D deficiency effect on muscle and bone. So people who generally get depressed, for example, you think vitamin D could help them? There is some data to suggest that vitamin D deficiency increases risk of developing schizophrenia, um, Alzheimer's disease, and depression. So there's absolutely no reason not to increase your vitamin D intake, and it could very well help some people with depression. That's pretty dramatic, isn't it? I mean, like I said, every tissue and cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor, and that includes brain, prostate, colon, skin. Your bones, of course, your intestines, of course, heart. We know, for example, now that if you're vitamin D deficient, you have a 50% increased risk of developing a heart attack. If you're vitamin D deficient and you have a heart attack, you have a 100% increased risk of dying. Of, uh, of the years of research, was there anything out there that startled you, shocked you, that you didn't expect? Well, I think the um, one of the major breakthroughs, I think, by Dr. Maudlin and Dr. Adams at UCLA is a, is a very interesting observation. And that is we knew over 100 years ago that people that had tuberculosis, if they were put out in the sunlight, so that's why solariums were developed, that they got better. And we could never understand why, although we always thought that there was a vitamin D connection. And there they demonstrated that immune cells need vitamin D to fight infections. 
Remarkable. Let's come back and take some phone calls with you, Michael. Final calls, as a matter of fact, on Coast to Coast AM. On our next Coast to Coast program, Richard Sauter joins us as we talk about underground bases and tunnels. What is the government trying to hide? Should be a fascinating program. Dr. Michael Halleck, and we're talking about vitamin D and some of your other questions as well. We'll go to the phones in just a moment. Is is beyond what you're doing, Michael, incredible work. Is science jumping on board? Are they going to make uh, recommendations, for example, to the FDA about what the uh, the units of vitamin D should be? It turns out that um, because of, of all the press that's um, come about, uh, and it's mainly um, actually um, people going to their doctors asking to have their vitamin D level drawn. It's called the 25-hydroxy vitamin D level. Um, and the doc reluctant to do it, but finally doing it, realizing the patient's vitamin D deficient, and now doing it on all their patients. They're now finding that vitamin D deficiency is probably the most common medical problem in the United States in both children and adults. This has finally got the attention of government. And so the Institute of Medicine has just convened a committee, and they're hoping to come out with new recommendations hopefully in early summer of next year that hopefully will substantially increase the recommended allowance for both children and adults for vitamin D. Okay, next up, let's go to East of the Rockies caller, John in Louisiana. Hey, John, thanks for calling. How are you all this, this evening? Good. Okay, I couldn't help but think well, when he's talking about uh, we graduated in some that college in 69. I was thinking I graduated in 69 myself. It was from the University of Quang Tree, though. I got plenty of sun over there. <laughs> he sure did. Took my last chopper ride out of there in August 69 and looked back. Anyway, I was just <laughs> wondering... Um, um, uh, the, the, as far as the sun goes, you know, the, how about the, you know, uh, skin cancer and the pruning effect and all that that the sun has on you over, you know, a period of time? No, it's an excellent question, and the dermatologists, of course, are, are very concerned about this, and appropriately so. The problem is that abstinence never works, and that the type of recommendation I'm suggesting, like maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes, arms and legs a couple of times a week, will not increase your risk, in my opinion, of skin cancer. It's mainly excessive exposure to sunlight, sunburning experiences that um, will increase risk of non-melanoma skin cancer, and it principally occurs on the face. So I always recommend, always wear sun protection for your face. It's the most sun exposed and the most sun damaged. But exposing your arms and legs a couple of times a week, in my opinion, will not increase your risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. I remember in my earlier days, Michael, if I went down to South Beach in Miami, I would get a uh, first-time sunburn, and I'd get a fever at night. I must have had just too much sun. That's not good, is it? Very bad. And, in fact, it, it can increase your risk of developing melanoma, which is, of course, the most deadly form of skin cancer. And exactly. just for, for your li- listener's interest, you know, I have a website, vitamindhealth.org. It's all one word, vitamindhealth.org. And on there is an hour presentation by me that they can watch and lots of information about vitamin D. All right. Next up, we go trucking in California. Ray, it's your turn. Hey, Raymond, go ahead. Hey, Mr. Nori and uh, Mr. Mike, I'm so glad for this show tonight. It's just really great. Listen, my wife is an African-American, and she has lichen planus. I want to would that help her in vitamin D? It, It certainly won't. Um, hurt her, and there is evidence that vitamin D plays an important role in skin health. So I would encourage her to be taking at least 2,000 units of vitamin D a day, and she may feel better as well. Sure, yeah, because she doesn't get out much, and I tell her she should. She's kind of a stay-at-home wife. She's 66, but uh, we're trying to move, so we're trying to get a little ranch up north so I get her we be out in the sun more, but right now I need something else. I personally take 2,000 units a day. I cycle and I play tennis outside. And I tell everyone that they should probably be taking between 1,000 and 2,000 units a day on top of their sun exposure. It won't hurt you, and it can Uh definitely increase your health. So you think it might help that lichen planus, though? Possibly. 
Um, it right. does have an effect on barrier function, and that lichen platinus can certainly have, um, you know, be related to that. All right. Thank you very much for your for all your information. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. My Mr. pleasure. Mike. Absolutely. Where do you go from here, Michael? I mean, do you continue to do research into this? And if you do, what's next? Well, I'm giving uh, what, what we've been interested in is that milk is the major food source that's fortified with vitamin D. And, and there are a lot of people that either don't want to drink milk or they can't tolerate milk. So we showed several years ago that you can actually put it in orange juice. And so we're now looking at other ways of fortifying foods with vitamin D, which could have a significant health benefit for both children and adults. Absolutely. We also have programs underway right now looking at the role of they being exposed to simulated sunlight for men with prostate cancer, asking the question, is there something maybe being made special in your skin above and beyond just vitamin D itself that's having a health benefit? And we hope to have some of those answers within the next couple of years. Why do we get these supplements, these vitamins from food sources, for example, from the sun? Why isn't the body just simply producing it all by itself? Well, throughout evolution, of course, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers and foragers. They were always exposed to sunlight. They were probably making, on average, three to 5,000 units of vitamin D a day. We don't do this anymore. That's the problem. If you think about this from Mother Nature's perspective, if you needed to guarantee that humans would get that nutrient, what better way than getting it from sun exposure? Because everybody thousands of years ago were always outside in the sun all the time. And they had enough skin pigmentation to protect their skin, but they had enough sun exposure to make enough vitamin D. We don't take advantage of the beneficial effect of sunlight anymore which is the major reason why vitamin D deficiency is a global health problem. Let's go to Janesville, Wisconsin. Kathy, it's your turn. Morning. Hi, George. How are you? Good, Kathy. Good. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Um, I had a hysterectomy in any way. Um, because of the full hysterectomy, I had to take calcium with vitamin D. Well, um, then I had increased pain all over in my body. I had it like in my ribs and in my hip and all that kind of stuff. Well, to make a long story short, it turned out that I had multiple myeloma, which is cancer of the plasma cells of the blood, and that was eating holes in my bones from the inside out. And why was it that that caused me so much pain? Because if I would stop the calcium with the vitamin D, the pain went away. But it, it, I'm glad I took it because it helped find the cancer, but... I had increased pain when I took the calcium with the vitamin D. Um, could you explain why that might be? Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm, I don't have any idea. It's just possible that, you know, when you were starting the calcium and vitamin D, that the disease just became more active. But I'm not sure that it was due to your calcium and vitamin D. I mean, I give, I see patients with multiple myeloma, and we make sure that they get enough calcium and vitamin D because... It helps to maintain their bones because the multiple myeloma definitely can chew up your bones and cause you to fracture. Michael, if the body had to do away with one vitamin, one that it did not take, what would it be? Which is the least of, uh, of, of the vitamins that uh, won't hurt you if you're not taking it? Uh, well, vitamin K probably because you make it yourself. Bacteria in your gut can make it, so it's not essential. And probably vitamin E as well um, are less critical, but vitamin A, the B vitamins, C, and certainly D are critically important. I'll give you a couple of additional perspectives. Sure. We're, we know now that during pregnancy, women that are vitamin D deficient at a much higher risk of having preeclampsia. They have a higher risk of having a C-section when they're giving birth. In fact, a 400% increased risk of having to have a C-section if they're vitamin D deficient. But more importantly, young girls that are vitamin D deficient have a deformed pelvis, and therefore they have a difficult time, if not impossible time, to have childbirthing. That's the reason why in evolution, pigmentation devolved in order for people to be able to make enough vitamin D. 